Good morning. He is risen. Let's try that once more. You weren't ready. I caught you off guard. That's not fair. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Absolutely. We are here to celebrate for that reason. We're here every Sunday to celebrate that. Amen? Amen. But specifically today, we are here to remember and uh, to thank the Lord for the sacrifice of his son. For that reason, we know that we are sinners. For that reason, we have forgiveness from that sin. And so we are here just to worship for that reason. My name is Nathan. I am the pastor of ministries here. Um, we have uh, some cards out there in the lobby. If you are a guest this morning, will you please take a moment and fill one of those out? If, you, if they didn't hand you one on the way in the door, you can grab one after the service, fill that out, drop that in the plate, or even better yet, hand that to me. I'll be out there in the lobby after the service. Um, we may have a gift for you if you get that card to me. So make sure one of those gets filled out. Um, we just want to know that you are here and be able to contact you and to pray for you. If you are a uh, first-time guest online watching us, please go ahead and give us an email or make a, post a message there on Facebook. We just want to know that you're watching and be able to contact you there as well. Pray with me this morning, will you? God, we are so thankful. We are so thankful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. God, if you never did anything else for us, we would spend our lives and eternity thanking you for the sacrifice of your son. But God, the fact that because of that sacrifice, you have adopted us as your children. And we are eternally grateful. And today we come before you to lift up our voices and to worship and celebrate in, in song and in prayer and fellowship and in hearing your word. All just to love you, just to worship you, just to praise you so that your name is glorified this morning. And we thank you that when Jesus was crucified on that cross and buried in that borrowed tomb, that Friday didn't last, that Saturday didn't last, that Sunday came. And we thank you that Jesus rose. And God, as that angel said to the ladies when they came looking for his body, why do you seek the living among the dead? Lord, that's the message that we want to proclaim to our community, to our world, that everywhere you're looking is death. Because Jesus isn't there. Look to him. God, give us those opportunities. Lord, work through us to be what you've called us to be in this community, in this city, in this state, and beyond. God, we give you this service. We do ask that your name would be lifted up and glorified. I ask that if there's anyone that does not have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ this morning, that you would draw them even now, and that none of us would be able to leave here the same way that we came in, that we'd be made more like Jesus and drawn closer to you with every moment. And we pray all of this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection not just as a one-time occurrence, commemorating it and, and remembering back, but we celebrate it because of what that means for us today. Amen? And our call to worship speaks to just that. It comes out of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verses, verse 24 and following. says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, listen, this is our hope, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those 
who are eagerly waiting for him. That's why we worship this morning.
thank you so much for your power. The power that rose you from the dead. And God, we know that the power that you have is still alive today. Friday and Saturday are gone. Sunday is here. And we celebrate that you are still in charge. You are still moving. You are still the same God that rose yourself from the dead. And this morning, God, we just come to you to worship you, to praise you, to give you honor and glory for who you are. And God, to tell you thank you for sharing that same love with us, for giving us that same power. given us that hope to know that you are coming back again and we cannot wait we long for it but until then God you've told us to do things to love others to tell them about who you are to serve them and God we just pray that you will use us use this church, our families, to reach those that don't know your power, that don't know your grace and your love and your hope. Because of what you've done, you've been, that gives us hope, knowing that you are that same God, and you are still alive, and that you are still moving in our lives. God bless this church everyone who's watching online or anyone who's sitting in this room right now, God, we just ask that you will just overwhelm us with your spirit. Continue to bless us with health, with amazing families, with our jobs, with our time, and our ability to serve you and to love you God, you are so amazing. And on this Easter Sunday, we just want to take that moment to recognize that and to praise you and to say thank you and to say we love you. And we pray all this in Christ's holy and precious name.
Good morning. It is great to see you all here uh, gathered together on this Easter Sunday uh, morning. And if you remember just a year ago that we were all dispersed in our homes, unable to gather together, watching um, all of this take place on our phones and TVs and computers. And I remember uh, specifically there was one um, idea that was brought to my attention that was a good idea that, hey, since we are all kind of home and unable to gather together and unable to get uh, dressed up all nice and look nice, maybe what we can do is we can have um, people submit pictures of themselves dressed up nice. So I said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. So we, uh, so we did that, and we, we had people kind of submitting pictures of themselves dressed up nice. And, you know, it was really um, a great idea until I realized that um, we had to get six people who had been quarantined, you know, for a little while, uh, dressed up, looking nice, and smiling all at the same time uh, for a picture. Because I'm like, how can I say we should do this and not do this myself, right? So it sounded like a great idea until that happened. And I, I kid you not, it was, um, it was a nightmare, okay, to get all of that to take place, okay, to get, because it's one thing to get, you know, your kids and your family dressed up to go somewhere. It's another thing to get them dressed up to go nowhere, okay? We're telling them, we're like, you're not going anywhere. We're just taking a picture. It's hard enough to get your kids to take a picture, right, when, when they're somewhere. So, so we are, so we go through this whole pic- period, and um, I remember snapping the picture, and we, you know, we posted the picture, and we will always look back and just see through the picture of the scene that went on behind scenes, and I'm not going to go into detail about what was happening there. There may have been a few threats um, and other things that took place to get six people to smile in that picture. But have you ever in your life had times where you just said, I don't want to deal with this right now? Have you ever had moments, that was a moment for me, where I don't want to deal with this right now? I don't have time to deal with this right now. I'm not going to deal with this right now. Have you ever had moments like that in your life? You ever had situations like that in your life where you said, you know, I'm just not going to deal with it? I think all of us have. There's times in our lives where there are things that we're just not going to deal with. One of those for me is it took me um, too long before I finally went in and had you know, an annual physical, you know, I'm always told, and people look at me weird when I say how long it had been since I'd gone in and had a physical, just nothing really brought me into the doctor, and so I finally went in, had my annual physical done, but before then, I just basically said, I don't have time to deal with it. I don't have a doctor, I don't know where to go, I just, I don't want to deal with it, so I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off. But you know, there's times in your life, and there are things in your life that you know that you have no choice but to deal with it. There are times and things in your life where you know, where you come face to face with the reality that you have to deal with it. It's one thing for my kids, right, to to pose in a picture and maybe I don't want to have to deal with it, but if my kid comes to me with a broken leg, I can't just, you know, They're kind of hobbling, dragging their leg across. You know, I'm not just going to say, you know, you just need to, I don't know, walk it off. Because I don't have time to deal with it. If I go into the doctor and the doctor gives me a diagnosis and it's something that I may not have wanted to hear and I may not feel like I have time in my life for that, but here's the reality that I'm facing. I have to deal with it. See, what happens in life is many times... When we look at Jesus Christ, I believe throughout our world, and even in our lives personally, I think many people just never take time to deal with it, to deal with who he is, to deal with who he claimed to be, to deal with what he did, and to deal with the grace that has been given to us as a result of that. And if you ask the question, why? Why are there some things that we deal with and some things that we don't deal with, some things that we say, I don't have time and I'm not going to deal with that right now, and other things we know we don't have a choice 
I think what we recognize is it's the implications behind that, right? Like if, if my children decide they're not going to pose for an Easter picture, it's not the end of the world, but if my child's got a broken leg, I know things are not going to get better. See, you come face to face and you understand the implications there. You understand what's at stake. And so many of us, I believe, sometimes in life, we don't recognize the implications because I think there's two people, two types of people that don't truly, don't fully deal with the implications of Jesus Christ. What we celebrate today has more implication on your life than any other thing in the history of the world. The the resurrection of Jesus has more implication on your life, whether you are a Christian or not, than anything in the history of the world. And so why would people not deal with that? I think first off, there's a group of people much like me, the person, the real reason why, would Jeremy, if you, if you go so many years, never gone into a doctor, never had a physical, like, why would you do that? Why would you put that off? Why would you be able to do that? And here's why, under the underlying belief right inside of me is that I'm fine, that I'm a relatively healthy person, that maybe I'm not perfect, that maybe I make some, you know, some poor decisions or whatever, but overall, here's my belief about myself. I believe that I'm pretty much a healthy person. And therefore, since I believe I'm pretty much a healthy person, I don't need to go and deal with a doctor. I don't need to deal with that. I got other more important things to deal with right now. Likewise, in our lives, we can believe that we're pretty good people, that we live pretty good lives, that we are kind, that we're nice, that we come from good backgrounds. And yeah, we're not perfect. And yeah, we don't always do the right thing and don't always say the right thing. And yeah, we make some mistakes now and then. But you know, overall, I'm a pretty good guy. And so I know there's all these things about Jesus, but you know, I'm just, I just don't have time to deal with it. And then I think there's another group. And many of you may have known people like this actually physically in this condition where they're so far gone, where there's so much that's going on with them, where they've been dealing with so much sickness and so many health problems and and so much that's going on inside of them that they don't want to deal with it because they know that they're sick. They know that the prognosis is not good. They know that they're dealing with stuff and they just don't want a doctor to tell them one more thing wrong with them. Have you known people like that? They don't even want to go to a doctor, not because they don't believe anything's wrong. They know something's wrong. And they don't want to come face to face with that reality. And I think there's people right now that are all around us. And we know our past. And we know what we've done. And we know the sin that's in our lives. And we know the hurt people that we've hurt in the past. And we know all the mistakes that we have made. And we know all the regret that we have. And we know all the shame that we feel. And we know all these things. And we know that's good. And we, don't, and we know we're not good people. In fact, we know we're, we're bad people. In fact, we believe that we're so far gone that there's no hope for us. And so the last thing we want to do is come face to face with that because we believe that it's beyond hope for us. So we just don't want to deal with it. Our life's too much of a mess. We're in too deep. We have too many problems. And here's where all of us need to land this morning. No matter where you are, no matter what your past is, no matter what your present is, no matter what you feel about yourself, everyone has to deal with Jesus Christ. There is no greater implication for your life than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start. We're going to move around this morning. John 14. Jesus is with his disciples before he's betrayed. He is speaking to them. He is kind of reassuring them. 
He's leaving them with some words. Verse 14 and verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, here's one thing that I want us to think about is the first thing we have to deal with is we have to deal with the claims of Jesus because a lot of people they have beliefs about Jesus and if you think about even in our world most people are not hostile towards the name Jesus most people don't think negatively about Jesus in fact even if you look at other religions other religions would hold Jesus in a good light they would say he was a good teacher they say he was a good man. They say he was a prophet. Overall, people, even other religions, would view Jesus as a good person. Now, you know what's interesting about that? Jesus claimed to be God himself. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I am God himself. Jesus is saying here, I am the only way. Jesus is saying there is no other way to the Father except through me. I am the only way. I am the life. If you see me, you see also the Father. Now those are claims to where you can no longer be just a good person, a good teacher, a prophet, claim that you are God himself. Claim that you are the only way. Claim these things and go down in history as a good person. See, here's the reality. Because if you think about just any, any person in history, if that person goes through life making false accusations, making claims, saying things that are not true, has a group of people behind them following these false claims, following these false accusations, if there comes a point where that person is killed for that, where that person is shown to be a phony, shown to be a fake, shown to be a liar, you know what history doesn't remember them as a good person. History doesn't remember them as a good teacher. History would remember them as a fraud. History would remember them as a phony. History would remember them as a fake. But Jesus isn't remembered like that. And Jesus claimed that he is God himself, that Jesus claimed that he is the only way. Jesus claimed that when you see him, you see God himself. And the claims of Christ were what, were, what was brutally rejected while he was walking on the earth by those that were opposed to him. The claims of Christ are what is offensive today. Talking about Jesus doesn't offend people, but when you talk about the claims of Christ, when you start saying that Jesus is the only way, and the implication of that is saying, well, well, if you're saying that Jesus is the only way, then that means that all of these other religions, what they believe, will not lead to salvation. And, we're, and I'm saying, that's not what I said, that's what Jesus said. Jesus made that claim. Jesus said that in his word. 
And Jesus says that I am fully God and that when you see me, you see the Father. And there's so many people that don't deal, don't come face to face with the claims of Jesus. See, you can't be in the middle of Jesus. You can't talk about Jesus as a good guy. You can't say that he's a, a good teacher, that he's a prophet. But I'm not sure, I'm not really sure about the, the fully God thing. I'm not sure about the only way thing. I'm not sure that Jesus can be the only way. Because here's the thing, there's only two sides you can be on if you really truly deal with Jesus. Either Jesus is who he says he is. And Jesus did what he said he was going to do. Or he was a phony, and he was a fake, and he was a liar. You can't believe that Jesus is a good guy without believing Jesus was who he claimed to be. Second, you need to deal with the resurrection of Jesus. Let's look in verse... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3. For I have delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, Though some have fallen asleep. Now the Apostle Paul is writing this to the church in Corinth. And here's what he's saying to these new believers. He's saying that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, if that's not true. And there were people at that time that were trying to come up with different answers for the resurrection of Jesus. See, it's an event that happened in history. They were trying to explain it. They're trying to explain the empty tomb. They're trying to come up with reasons why it might not have been what his disciples were claiming, right? And Paul says that if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then we are all to be pitied. Meaning, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then everything that we're doing here, we should be pitied. It is, it is a complete waste. What Paul's saying is everything hinges on the, on the event that Jesus did rise from the dead. Everything that we're doing, everything that we're teaching, everything that we believe hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And he also challenges them, and he says, you know, and there were witnesses. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to 500 people. 500 people at the time that, that Paul's writing this says that are still living. Go ask them. They're around. Go find them. That's how he's writing this, right? He's writing this to say, listen, this is an event that happened. Everything hinges on this event. And if there's questions and if people have questions, go ask the witnesses. Go ask the people that Jesus appeared to. They'll tell you what they saw. And this is what we see, that even as the government tried to shut it down, that Christianity continued to flourish until a point where a few hundred years later, over 50% of the Roman population identified as Christian. Something happened. And many of us don't give it much thought, but here's what is not debated much. Even in history, when you look at history and how history recorded, right, the events, here's, here's things that are not debated much by historians, that Jesus was a real person who was born in Bethlehem. Jesus had a father named Joseph who was a carpenter. Jesus was baptized by John the baptizer before he started his ministry. He was known as a wise teacher. He was crucified by the Roman government. Time has been split in two based off the life of Jesus. He was buried in a tomb. His tomb was empty two days after his death. His followers claimed to see him alive, and they worshipped him as God. The Roman government never produced his body, and Jewish and Roman authorities developed alternative explanations to the resurrection. All of those things happened. History shows that all of those things happen. Few people will debate that any of those things happen. And here's the one thing that leads to all of that. 
did Jesus raise from the dead? Because if Jesus raises from the dead, that makes him God. Nobody has ever done that in the history of the world. And that means that he defeated death, that he provided the way, that he served as the perfect sacrifice and is the one who can save us. He is the one that can rescue us. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. And do you know why history doesn't rem remember Jesus as a fraud? Do you know why history doesn't remember Jesus as a liar? Do you know why history doesn't remember Jesus as a bad guy? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And that has changed people forever. And it's not just that he rose from the dead, but it's the grace of Christ and how he came, he died on our behalf, and he rose from the grave. See, many of us may understand the story, may understand the claims of Jesus, may say, I, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and I believe that he rose from the grave. I can accept those things. But here's the other thing that we all have to come face to face with. We have to come face to face with, we have to deal with the grace of Jesus. Let's look in John 20, starting verse 11. We're going to look two accounts of those. So starting in verse 11, this is after the tomb has been found empty. And it says that, but Mary stood outside the tomb. And as she wept, she, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. Now, first off, Jesus meets us with his grace, and we are hopeless. If you think about this moment that we're, that we're seeing captured in Scripture, and you think about all the events that have taken place, and if you've even taken the time over the last couple of days to think about how these events had unfolded, I want you just to imagine the helplessness and the hopelessness that, that's really filling all of the people that had been following Jesus. Think about the feeling that they would have been feeling when Jesus, they're, 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 there's all this expectation of what Jesus is going to do, and, and even as he's being nailed to the cross, they're hoping something's going to happen. But then there's this moment where Jesus is, is dead. Where Jesus is put into a tomb. Where there's a stone put over that tomb. Where there's guards guarding that tomb. And then all day Saturday, nothing. Do you imagine that feeling? You've given your life to follow this person. You're kind of holding out hope for something to happen and nothing happens. Can you imagine that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness? Could you imagine just that feeling of agony, just that feeling of despair, just that feeling of, of, of almost wanting to give up? And here's Mary Magdalene, an insignificant follower of Jesus, goes to the tomb just to, to put some spices and some things on his body. And he's gone. And you know what she thinks in that moment? Someone must have stolen the body. And it's just like the bad has just gotten worse. You know, that she's in this, it's just this moment where it's like she, she's, she's following Jesus and then, and then this happens and now she's going just to, to, to go and to, to prepare the body and, and, and it's gone. Like what else could go wrong? She's already at her lowest point. It just goes lower, and she's in this hopeless state. She's in this helpless state, right? 
She's in this moment where she's confused and she's helpless and she's hopeless. You ever been there? You ever felt like that? You ever understood what it feels like to be hopeless and confused and helpless? But in the midst of that, in the midst of her despair, in the midst of her hopelessness, in the midst of her confusion, in the midst of her helplessness, Jesus says, Mary. See, Jesus meets her where she is. Jesus meets, meets her in the middle of her pain, in the middle of her despair, in the middle of her helplessness. Jesus comes, Jesus meets her there, Jesus, and Jesus invites her, Jesus reveals himself to her, Jesus says, here I am, this is who I am, I am alive. And she's physically clinging to him, because I'm sure in this moment she never wants him to get away from her again, right? And Jesus says, don't cling to me physically. He says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go and to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene, not a significant follower of Jesus, a woman that loved Jesus, that followed Jesus in the midst of her despair, went and said, I have seen the Lord. See, that's an act of grace. See, Jesus, in, in this moment of grace, has met Mary where she is, has met Mary in the midst of her despair, in the midst of her confusion, has shown himself to be the resurrected Savior. Let's look in verse 24. It says, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have seen, who have not seen and yet have believed. Now there is Thomas that doubts. And everybody knows that what we call Thomas is, right, a doubting Thomas, right? Don't be a doubting Thomas. But here's what I want you to think about the reality of Thomas, because it's easy for us to look at Thomas and say, you know, Thomas, why did you doubt? But think about this. Think about giving your life to following Jesus. Think about all the events that have taken place over the last couple of days. Think about the feeling it feels, the utter defeating, right? This, this just, just this, this feeling inside of him. And then you have the, the disciples that are telling him, listen, he's, he's risen from the grave and, and he's appeared to us and we've seen him, right? And you think that that would be enough for him. But in the midst of that, there's, there's this unbelief. In the midst of that, there's this doubt. In the midst of that, there's probably this fear of, I don't even want to get my hopes up again. I don't even want to go back there again. And, in, and what's interesting is, even in that moment, Thomas says, this is what it's going to take for me. I, I, I can't get there. I can't believe what you're saying. Like, this is what it's going to take for me. It's going to take, it's going to take literally putting my fingers in the, in the holes where the nails were, in his side where he was pierced. That's what it's going to take. Like, I can't get there. And eight days go past. And there's nothing. And then Jesus appears. And it's always interesting, too, how Jesus appears because it says the doors were locked and Jesus is just there. It's like, hey, I just decided to join y'all. 
And he looks at Thomas, and he says, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. In the midst of his doubts, in the midst of his unbelief, Jesus meets him there. See, it's the grace of Jesus. What we don't deserve, what we don't have coming for us. See, see, Jesus knows where you are. Jesus knows what you're struggling with. Jesus knows your doubts. Jesus knows your fears. Jesus knows your unbelief. Jesus knows your struggles. Jesus knows your confusion. Jesus knows, and he meets you there. And some of us have struggled to come face to face with that grace. Some of us in our inside of us. We just struggle to get there. Because see, it's grace that changes us. Jesus met Mary in her despair and hopelessness. Jesus met Thomas in the midst of his doubt and unbelief. And then there's a moment where shortly after this, Jesus meets Peter. And Peter has denied Jesus three times. G G Peter was the one that said, I, I will never, I will never deny you, Jesus. And Jesus says, before the roaster crows this day, you will deny me three times. And imagine that feeling, right, when that third time happened. And, and Peter recognizes, he remembers, he realizes what's happened. And all of these events have taken place, and Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has risen from the dead. Imagine the guilt, imagine the shame. Imagine the regret. And Jesus comes to Peter. And he has this interaction with Peter. And essentially, here's what he's telling Peter. I'm not done with you yet. And that's an act of his grace. See, he could have looked at Peter and said, out of all I said and all I've done and all I've shown you, and you deny me just like I said you would, I'm done with you. But instead, Jesus meets Peter where he is. And Jesus, the message that he has to Peter, is I'm not done with you yet, Peter. That's what changed Peter. Peter. And that's what changed his disciples, and that's what changed the followers. It was, it was that Jesus rose from the grave. It was that Jesus did what he said he was going to do, and it was the grace of Jesus that changed their hearts and changed their lives. See, some of us have not come face to face with the grace of Jesus. Some of us have not come to this point where we have dealt with his grace See, there are people right now, and some of us are hiding because we just can't fathom the idea. We just can't get our minds around the idea that we could be fully loved and fully known. See, some of us have this belief inside of us that if people really knew who I wa wa was, and people really know who I am, and they know all that there is to know about me, they are not going to love me. And so we live life putting on a front. We live life acting a certain way. We live life saying the right things. And listen, and then we also hide from God himself because here's the reality. We're like, we, we know God, God does fully know me. God does fully know everything about me. God does fully know my fears. He knows my doubts. He knows my unbelief. He knows my sin. He knows my past. There's no way he can accept me for that. There's no way he can fully love me. And so we don't come face to face with the grace of Christ. See, Jesus died while we were still sinners. Jesus died for our sins when we could not offer anything in return. Jesus fully knows you. He knows everything about you, and he fully loves you. 
It's this grace that changes people. It's this grace that radically changes lives. It's this grace that changes our hearts. And some of us have not come face to face with the grace of Christ because we've not come face to face with the gravity of our sin. We've gone through life believing that everything's okay and that we're okay and that somehow in the end we're going to be okay. But Jesus is inviting us to recognize our real state, to show us how sinful we really are, to show us the price that had to be paid to meet us where we are based off of his grace and mercy and to invite us into a relationship with him. That's the God we serve. That's the Jesus we follow. And that changes people. See, when you come face to face with who Jesus is, when you come face to face with, Jesus, with what Jesus did, which is rising from the dead, and when you come face to face with the grace that Jesus offers you, you and your life, it changes you. You can't be the same. You can't live the same. You can't think the same. You can't view the world the same. It changes you because it changed his followers. From that day on, they were never the same. In fact, history says that Peter um, was, was crucified at, for being a follower of Jesus, but he, he did not even feel worthy to be hung on a cross the way Jesus was, so he, so he made sure that he was hung upside down. That's the Peter that denied Jesus. A Peter that was changed radically by the grace of Jesus Christ. My question this morning for you, have you been radically chained by the grace of Jesus Christ? Have you fully come face to face with Jesus? Let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful that we are gathered here today. Thankful for what we're celebrating today. I'm thankful that today that we can proclaim that Christ has risen. That today we can proclaim that Jesus is alive. God, I pray for those in this room right now. I pray for those that are watching online. God, I pray for those that will be watching later. I pray no matter where anyone is today, that they experience the grace, the mercy, the love, and the forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can offer. God, I pray that there are spiritual eyes that are awakened to see Jesus for who he really is, to see Jesus for who he claimed to be, to see Jesus for what he really did. God, I pray that wherever we are, God, I pray we would have a, an encounter with his grace today and his mercy and his forgiveness. God, I pray that would change us in profound ways, in ways where we can never be the same, in ways where a watching world would say, there is something visibly different because we have been changed by the grace of Jesus. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is your time to respond however you feel led this morning. It may be that you just need to pray where you are. It may be a decision that you need to make today. Whatever that is, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you, I just encourage you today to say yes. Let's stand and sing.
all could be seated for just a moment. I've got some very exciting news. No, why don't you come up here, bud? Miss Deep, come up here too if you want. Most of you know, uh, this is my son Noah Hood, and um, uh, this week um, he has been praying and has been led um, to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Uh, can we give a wait? And so um, it's always been our prayers, parents, that um, our children arrive at that point um, based off of the Holy Spirit leading, and, and they're arriving at that place, and we can confidently say today that, that Noah has um, arrived there, and so we are celebrating that together, and um, he will be, obviously, we'll be making a motion for him to accept membership into the church, and we'll be baptized um, in the future as we uh, pick a date for him. So I have a, a motion. Second. All in favor say amen. 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 God is good, and because he lives, because Jesus rose from the dead, then we and my son can have life found in him. Praise God. Praise God for that. And we are just thankful um, today. I think just as you reflect on, on today and spend time with family today, there's good things today, there's difficult things today that you may be dealing with. But just remember, no matter where you are, and no matter how you feel, today we rec- we remember that Jesus rose from the grave. Amen. And because Jesus rose from the grave, you can have hope. That's right. And because Jesus rose from the grave, he will meet you where you are. That's right. With his grace. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all that has taken place. Thank you for all the people here that served so faithfully that made today possible. And God, we're thankful for all the people that have been around Noah. Teachers and those that have encouraged him, Awana leaders, all that have taken part in his spiritual development, pointing him to Jesus. God, we're thankful for so many that serve so faithfully here in so many ways so that we can make much of the name of Jesus. God, today as we leave, I pray that we are filled with excitement and hope that we have the answer. And that's a living, resurrected Jesus. Let us share this good news with the world in the same way that disciples shared when they had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. It's a message that's worth laying our lives down for. It's a message the world needs to hear. God, I pray, give us boldness. Give us joy. Give us peace today. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Because He Lives. One, two, three. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Happy Easter. He is risen.